Hi everybody, this is Mr. Vallejo. Welcome to class. Today we're going to take a look at classification. Uh, we're going to study taxonomy, the science of classification. Let me, let me remind you that uh, these PowerPoint notes are in your learning management system, whether that is Canvas or Schoology. Let's just uh, get started. Taxonomy. Taxonomy is, as you know, the science of classification. Instead of studying each and every one of those 1.6 million different species of, of animals, we group them together so that we can be more efficient as we study. Now, taxonomy was first developed uh, by uh, a gentleman named uh, Carl, Carl Linnaeus, Carolus Linnaeus. He was a Swedish botanist, and his, uh, his goal in life was to classify all the plants in Sweden. He did such a good job that he was recognized by the king of Sweden for his work. And today he is known as the father of taxonomy. Remember that for next time, or for, remember that for the end of this talk. Linnaeus is the father of taxonomy. Now, if we uh, take a look at the dog, as you can see in this photo, um, there, are, there are all kinds of different dogs, but they're all dogs, but in different languages, we call them different things. In German, we call it a Hund. In uh, Spanish, that little one is Perito. Might be a Cho in Vietnamese, um, but uh, they all have different names. Uh, the dogs, one species, different names in different languages for the same animal though. Now to, to make that even worse, in the same language, there might be different names for the same animal in the same language. This guy here is called a cougar or a mountain lion or a puma or a panther. Just depends on what part of the country uh, you're, you're coming from. And so this animal right here, even in English has multiple names. Well, that might be a little confusing. So in science, we have something called binomial nomenclature. With binomial nomenclature, this means it's a, a two, by like bicycle, nomial, a two word nomenclature is a system of naming things. So this is a two word naming system. For example, here's my sister, her name is Belia. Now, my mom used to tell me that uh, she made up that name and she took the, the first two letters out of, out of my dad's name, which was Ben, and the last two letters out of uh, my mom's name, which is Maria, and they took the L out of Vallejo to represent the love. And so my sister, her name is Belia. Now, um, Belia has a, a middle name. Her middle name is Francis. Now, I have a middle name also, but my middle name is Bondad because in the Filipino culture, what happens usually is you get, as your middle name, your mom's maiden name. So Belia actually has two middle names. One is Francis and one is Bondad. And I said to my mom, Mom, how come Belia got a real middle name and my name is Bondad? Well, my, my mom, she didn't speak English all that great. Um, it's kind of spoken in, uh, broken English. And she said to me when I was, gosh, I was young, seven, eight, nine, she said, oh, your sister has a middle name that's Francis because in San Francisco, that is where your dad and I consummated our marriage. Wow, consummate? I'm seven. I don't know what that means. And I know what that meant till I was 12. But my sister, she got, well, my mom and dad, well, anyway, my sister's middle name is Frances. Belia Frances Bondad. And, she, and she's my sister, so we have the same last name. Belia Frances Bondad Vallejo. But then she got married to Frank, and Frankie's last name is Johnson. So now her name is Belia Francis Bondad Vallejo Johnson. 
Well, when I used to call her work, she used to work at the UCLA, woo, the UCLA Medical Center. And that's a big place. Uh, they say that they had the second most corridors in a building compared to all buildings except for the Pentagon has uh, more, more corridors um, inside of it. So when I called her at the UCLA Medical Center, I didn't ask for Bellia Francis Bond at Vallejo Johnson. I just asked for Bellia Johnson. And then they would find her for me and then I talked to her on the phone. See, instead of having five names, each of those five names means something. Uh, Bellia, Francis, Francis, San Francisco, Bellia, my mom and dad's name. Alejo, she's in my family. Johnson, she used to be married to Frankie, and she actually never changed her, her last name. But Bonnie Francis Bond Abelio Johnson, uh, we just know her by two words. And same with uh, in biological systems. In biological systems, we know organisms that by their genus and their specific name, or sometimes we call it the specific epithet, Sometimes we call it the species name, even though that's a little confusing, and we'll see why in a little bit. Here are some examples. Homo sapiens, here's some homo sapiens here. Um, those are people. Um, that's actually my son. This is a really old uh, picture, and that's a friend of his that he knew for ever. Um, and she uh, starred as Cinderella, I think, in a school play. Uh, some of you are familiar with Canis familiaris. Yep, it's a dog. You know what Canis lupus is? It's a wolf. And if you look at it, they have the same genus name. So they are closely related. As you can see, they have some very similar physical characteristics. And then uh, two out of three families in the United States uh, have a canis familiaris, the rest of you guys are into Felis domesticus, domesticated Felixes. And yeah, there's Felix the cat right there. Aw, isn't that a cute photo? Well, uh, here you have levels of classification. Now there are different levels of classification. The genus and species name, which make up the scientific name, are the last two groups down here. But if we were to take all living things and classify them into a group, we would have six groups. Those six groups are called kingdoms. Now each of those kingdoms is subdivided into a smaller group called a phylum. And each of those phyla, that's plural for phylum, uh, is classified and broken down into a class. Then the classes break down to orders, and orders break down to families, and family, families break down to genera, and then each genus is broken down into a species. And that species is it. If you're in that species, you, uh, that's who, those individuals in the same species can reproduce successfully. Um, if you're not in the same species, then you don't, generally speaking. As you take a look at this list of taxons, this list of the levels of classification goes from biggest to smallest. And it also goes from general to more specific. So to be in the animal kingdom, you need to be made up of many cells. Those cells need to be eukaryotic cells with a nucleus. And you probably move around a little bit because you're an animal. So um, you have some characteristics that are the same as a dog, as a worm, as an insect even. So those are very different organisms, but they're all animals in the animal kingdom. Then the kingdom is broken down into many phyla. The animal kingdom is broken down into uh, over a hundred different phyla. We're in the phylum chordata, as we'll see in the examples. But my, what I'm trying to tell you here is that we go from, from more general characteristics to more specific characteristics as we go down the order of taxon. And we go from bigger, bigger, bigger to smaller, smaller, smaller as you go down this list. So it's important to know the order 
of the taxons. You need to know that the kingdom is bigger than the class. You need to know that the gen uh, genus is smaller than a phylum and so on and so forth. So to help you with that, um, I'm going to give you a mnemonic device, but let's take a look at some examples first. Here's a dog. A dog is in the animal kingdom. It's a chordata because it has a, it has a backbone with a cord in it. Um, it, uh, has, it has hair, as you can see in the photo of the Labrador Retriever, and it gives milk to its young. And so here's the other classification for a dog. All dogs are Canis familiaris, but there are different breeds of dogs, but they're all dogs. Dogs are very important, especially Labradors are very important. I have had six labs in my adult life. Here's some people, that's me, um, on a fishing trip several years ago with my two oldest sons. And you can see our classification, Kingdom Animalia, Phylum Chordata, Class Mammalia, Order Primates, and it goes down like this in the last two, again are our scientific name. So to remember the order, I give you this. From biology teacher to generations of biology students, this has been handed down. King Philip came over from Germany Saturday. A kingdom is larger than a class. A family is smaller than an order. A genus is bigger than a species. But here's another one um, that you may uh, remember more easily. Kids playing chicken on freeways get smashed. Get out of the road, kids. These are some kids uh, near downtown LA on the 110, I think, uh, from a mural that was painted for the 1986 Olympics. Right there, if you look closely, there's my tag. Just kidding. How many kingdoms are there? Um, an interesting question uh, answered by this smart guy over here. His name is Aristotle. If, if you can imagine 4,000 years ago looking out the window like I'm looking out right now, and I see all kinds of life. I see a lot of plants, and I see some birds. So I'm going to say there are two kingdoms 4,000 years ago, animals and plants. And that's what Aristotle said. But he further subdivided the animals into um, <clears throat> groups according to how they moved, whether they fly or swim or crawl on the earth. And he uh, classified the plants according to size, which may, may not have been a great choice, uh, grasses, shrubs, and trees. Because what about a really small tree when it first starts out? You might have a, a shrub that's bigger than that tree. So size may not be the uh, best uh, characteristic to use for uh, classification. So that was Aristotle 4,000 years ago, but Linnaeus came along, as you know, Linnaeus was in the 1700s, and he's still saying that there's two kingdoms. So it, this lasted for a long, long, long time. Um, as we've already studied, Van Leeuwenhoek uh, developed the microscope, and it wasn't until after Van Leeuwenhoek developed the microscope that um, Haeckel came up with three kingdoms. He said there's animal, plants, and then there's really small things. Those really small things we're going to call protista. You can see this uh, from this photograph here. The Haeckel was uh, a uh, contemporary of uh, maybe Lincoln, and is that what you guess? Um, that's about right. Uh, right about the same time as uh, Charles Darwin, uh, Haeckel came up with the third kingdom. Now, when I was in school, like you're in school now, I learned that there were five kingdoms. And um, those five kingdoms are the animals and plants and the protista, but the monera are the bacteria and then the fungi. Although they seem like plants, they actually eat like animals. So that's the five kingdom scheme. Today, we know that there's six kingdoms. And those six kingdoms actually come in three different subgroups, not subgroups, supergroups um, called domains. And it seems that the, the archaea are very different from the rest of them. So uh, we have the four groups right there are in one domain, 
and then we have the U bacteria in another domain. These are bacteria, but they're much different from these strange bacteria, the archaeobacteria that live in different conditions, like some are halophilic, that means they like to live in salt, and some are uh, some are thermophiles, which means they live in very, very hot temperatures, like the like uh, the water of nuclear silos, uh, uh, nuclear power plants. And so uh, the archaeobacteria are strange and off to the side like that. But after uh, very recently, actually, uh, they uh, new new biochemistry. New, new biochemical evidence, new DNA evidence tells us that the U bacteria are even more different. So maybe the archaeobacteria and the U bacteria flips places here. And the U bacteria are very, very different compared to the archaeobacteria. Um, nonetheless, there are three different domains and the four here are eukaryotic and the bacteria are in uh, two separate domains. So you can see a summary uh, diagram that tells us of the, uh, the the development of the idea of how many kingdoms are. You can see there's the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom uh, with uh, Aristotle way back here and then here's Linnaeus 1735 and you can see here that we have the five kingdom scheme in 1969 and finally the uh, six kingdom scheme comes along where you have the U bacteria and the archaeobacteria. I still refer to bacteria as a monera occasionally, but that is an archaic term. And we have the U bacteria and archaea right there. There are actually some other scientists who would think, well, maybe there are other groups like viruses. Um, viruses can reproduce, viruses can cause infections, viruses have uh information on dna so should viruses be in their own group sound like they have a lot of characteristics of living things well most scientists would say no um, viruses are not considered to be living things because they do not have their own cells so there is no seventh kingdom viri uh, here's a photo of Lynn Margulis, who was married to Carl Sagan, who you may know, but they're both uh, superstar scientists in their own right. Uh, Dr. Margulis proposed the idea of changing the protista to protoctista, which actually makes more sense because the protoctista would have um, unicellular eukaryotic organisms along with their multicellular relatives. So we have microscopic algae have the same cellular structure as macroscopic seaweed. Even the giant kelp off the coast of California, you know, those are huge. And uh, they have at the cellular level, cellular level the same structure as uh, unicellular green algae. Shouldn't they be in the same group? Sounds good. I think they should be in the same group. So since we're changing the um, parameters of the group, we should rename the group and call it Protoctista. That's not what happened. The name um, didn't actually catch on. The idea has caught on, but we still call that group the Protista. So if we take a look, we can see that there are the six major kingdoms. And if you know just these four pieces of information, you can pretty much narrow down which kingdom that organism belongs to. If you find an organism on a, on a, I don't know, on an island that just popped out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean because of the volcanic action over, over thousands and thousands, maybe millions of years, and you find an organism that's made up of one cell, but that cell is a complicated eukaryotic cell, then you know that your new organism is in the Protista Kingdom. When have you find a structure on that island that has been there a while, that is, uh, it's stuck in one place, but it's made up of cells, and it's made up of many cells, and the cells are all complicated with nuclei. Well, that is a plant. 
because a plant is eukaryotic, is multicellular, and doesn't move around. It, and it can make its own food. So through photosynthesis, the plant can make its own food. Now, if you take a look at some of these other uh, symbols that I put on here, um, this will tell you that uh, most uh, bacteria do not make their uh, own food, but that uh, some do. And over here, it's about half-half as far as groups go. Um, later on in the class, we'll take a look at Protista, um, and um, we'll take the protist group and subdivide it um, into uh, the animal-like Protista and the plant-like Protista. The ones that are more like animals don't make their own food. Uh, those are called the protozoans. The ones that can make their own food through photosynthesis, um, those are pigmented structures called algae. So um, that's what we mean by these uh, other uh, plus minus symbols here. So those are the six major kingdoms. So let's see if you got what you need to know. As we take a look at our Jeopardy slide, there's Alex Trebek for you. And this was the final question. This European 1751 Philosophia Botanica gave rules of nomenclature and said, don't change generic names. Hmm. And there's the Jeopardy theme for you. If you said, like this gentleman, Linnaeus, then you could have won on Jeopardy. I'm Mr. Vallejo, and this is Taxonomy. Uh, we'll see you next time. Bye now.